It's extremely timely to consider where our children are in the big picture of our screen culture because stories are at the centre of this symposium and our young and our future audience, our young people, are central to storytelling. As Dayman Salmon puts it, a small inventive intimate country like ours should be helping to build a bright, bright future, the kind of New Zealand of which we can all be proud. The time is now and the choice is ours. Here, here. Maybe it's time to reconsider who we compare ourselves to, though. Our small, inventive, intimate Aotearoa New Zealand is probably better compared to other small nations of the Nordic region than it is to other large nations. Certainly, we once shared an early and very proud history of child-centred social policy with the Nordic region, Denmark, Sweden, Finland and, um, and Norway. But alas, our child-centred focus in Aotearoa New Zealand has been dismantled and drifted downwards since the 1980s. And our children are the losers. Broadcasting, in turn, has followed this sad trend. And indeed, we're facing the real, policy, the real possibility that some commercial channels may feel increasingly free to look at commissions for children's production and say, nah, too difficult, not part of our core business model for shareholders. Increasingly, we need to ask, where are the screens for our precious storytellers to tell those stories to our children? Because other small nations manage to deliver to children and young people. Small Nordic nations swap short form live action drama, non fiction work regionally. And Maya Goetz from Germany recently suggested that we would be welcome to join their small nation club, sharing a heritage of child centeredness and traditions of great children's writing and scripting. I rather like the idea of Pippi Longstocking meets Margaret May. Our panel will explore some hard questions. Why does local storytelling matter? Why does it matter in a world of global choice? Will children even, and young people even watch local content given all the other distractions and high budget diversions? If they do, how can we broker new production models? Where can we look for new innovative distribution models? How can we exploit the new platforms? And in turn, under that, how will linear storytelling change to fit in with children's evolving media consumption? What's the relationship between linear storytelling for television and film and the games, apps, online social networking places that they frequent? So many questions, so little time. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our panel brings wide experience and vision to the task in hand. Uh, as I've said before, we welcome discussion along the way, but I aim to enable generous discussion at the end. Ian Hassel was New Zealand's first Commissioner for Children from 1984 to 1989 to 94. He is a paediatrician and a children's advocate and has campaigned for children's health, safety and rights. Tim Brooke Hunt, all the way from Australia for a day. Thank you, Tim. In 2007, Tim was appointed executive head of the children's content for ABC TV and became controller of children's in 2010. And in these roles led the launch of digital school age channels ABC in 2009 and the relaunch of preschool channel ABC4 in 2011. And both channels have become clear market leaders for their target, target demographics and Tim has much to share with us. Briar Grace Smith. Briar is from, of Napui descent and she's worked as a writer on various television stories. She's one of our precious storytellers. Being Eve, Makatu, and Kaitanga to Twitch. And Briar currently works at the New Zealand Film Commission as a development executive. And finally, but not least, Yvonne Mackay. Uh, Yvonne uh, works for, the, for, for her own production company, Production Shed TV, and she brings all the expertise gained from many years in the film and television industry. And her love of high quality family and children's drama has seen her create the multi award winning Kaitang Kaitangata Twitch for Maori Television, and most recently Story Tree for Kids Zone T uh, 24 on Sky Television. So, where to start? Um, I'm going to throw a question to you first, Ian Hassel. Mm -hmm. um, why 
uh, is this session so important? Well, I've prepared this by uh, starting with a, a trailer from the, uh, well, it's the official trailer from the uh, 2006 movie by Alfonso Cuaron, which many of you will have seen, uh, called uh, Children, Let's See It. Thank you. I'd be interested to know how many people uh, saw that movie so that I know who I'm speaking to, if anyone. So many of you have seen it. Okay. So I don't know, need to explain what it's about, and you will have seen from that clip. But one of the things that you can begin with is that it says that children's interests are a political issue. A political issue. Now, it's obvious that that's the case if you look at for example, the government's recent white paper on vulnerable children uh, and the Rebstock inquiry into welfare that's been translated recently into legislation. That's on that scale. But what's not so obvious is that children's well-being is central to the well-being of any human society. We pay attention to children's needs out of love and compassion and sentiment and because, of course, that's what we're programmed to do. And maybe for some people, because we expect children to project our work and our beliefs into a future time. But what's not so apparent is what children do for us. They civilise us. Children civilise us. They teach us forbearance and selflessness and investment in the common wheel. And those are values that are badly needed in today's society. So that's why I've spoken in this frame, because it's the big frame, it's where are kids in the big picture. It's not, in the first instance, about... Uh, media, broadcast, the people that are gathered here today, the industry that you're part of. But that industry is a very important part of that bigger picture of placing children where they need to be so that our society can flourish. <clears throat> We could um, discuss that or leave it as a very big frame and move straight into uh, Tim's presentation, which will raise a whole lot of discussion, I think. So, um, Tim, thank you. Thank you, Ruth, and <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, I've been involved in, in the production of children's programming for nearly 30 years. I'm afraid to say, and over the last six feet as a broadcaster. Um, and what I would like to do today is to share with you some research that has been carried out recently by uh, Screen Australia and the Australian Children's Television Foundation into what children want to watch and how they want to watch it. Not because I think Australia and New, Ze New Zealand and Australia are exactly the same, but I have observed in my career that children the world, all over the world have similar wishes, desires, aspirations. And there may be something that uh, you here in New Zealand can learn from the experience we've had in Australia. So I hope it will be helpful. Um, this, uh, this is, um, if you want to go to the first thing, this is, uh, as I said, uh, some research. And uh, if we could go to the next one, please. It, this was done from the, from the point of view of the child audience, broadcasters, and producers. The context of it, which is a bit at the top, was really that there is some concern in Australia about what, about you know, what, a, a slight decline in drama production for children and trying to find out what's going on. That was the context of it. Now, this, this find, these are the principal findings of the research. Most importantly, that children do want to watch programs made specifically for them. That scheduling is the key 
to the success of programs on television and that the financing of children's content is becoming ever more difficult. If we could go first of all to the child audience. Um, this research was carried out by Jigsaw Strategic Research uh, um, with over a thousand children and their parents in Australia. Uh, the, the, the age range of children that were, that were interviewed was between 2 and 14, and you will find that the results of this research uh, is divided between kids up to 7 and those over 7 to 14, because truthfully, there are two children's audiences. There's a preschool audience and there's a school age audience, and we have to be clear about that. So if we could go to the next one, please. This slightly complicated graph makes a very simple point. There are, and uh, you know, to explain, these down the right are all the, uh, uh, the channels that, that, that program for children in Australia. Um, ABC 1, 2, and 3 are the, uh, the public broadcaster for which I'm responsible. Um, and then, as you will see, 7, uh, 9, and 10, and their, um, and their digital channels are the commercial players. But what is true for all of them is that there are two times when kids go to watch content. It's in the mornings before school, uh, this is for the school ages, and uh, when they get back from school. Once you get to about seven in the evening and adult programming is available, from that point, many school aged children prefer to watch, uh, li or like to watch adult programming at that point. Um, but that's just a... Um, a, uh, uh, just to introduce that, if we could go to the next one, please. Um, what this, uh, what this uh, shows is that um, split between preschool and school age, the channels that uh, have been watched by children of that age group. And I think if we could go to the next one, what is more important, however, is what the children like watching. And I think you see there the dominance of, um, in preschool, uh, of the, of the uh, preschool channel on ABC. School age also, ABC3, which is a school age channel. Uh, could we go to the next one, please? Um, parental control is a key issue that we have to consider in how children are going to consume content. If we could go to the next one. Um, this, there's quite a lot of information here, but it's, but it's worthwhile looking at this. Um, what this is showing is how, you know, what, what influences the choice of what to watch. And if we could go to the next one, please. The first point is that black is where children are not allowed to use at all. And of course, mobile phones are an area that parents seem to control very firmly, probably because of the expense uh, of doing so. And uh, whereas, um, if we go to the next one, um, on the internet, adults are also very concerned to make sure that kids are not straying into the wrong sorts of destinations. And the next one, please. Um, but there, uh, there is quite a lot of kids who are allowed to watch, say, specific internet destinations such as the ABC uh, online uh, pr provision where parents are confident that the content is going to be appropriate to the kids. Um, now this comes, this next one comes to the key point um, around what children prefer to watch. And children were asked about their preferences for different types of programs. And what was found was that whilst a lot of children like to watch family programming, there is a very strong preference for programs that are made specifically for them. 54% of children said they like children's programs best, compared with 11% for family and 4% for adult. Um, and uh, this is an overall 2 to 14 view, uh, but it makes an important point about the preferences that children have. 
The next one, please. Um, this kind of takes the, the same point, and, and, and what it's really showing is that as kids get older, so their interest in adult, it's a fairly obvious point, so their interest in adult programming uh, increases, but the enjoyment of family programming is fairly consistent through the age groups. The other point that I think was interesting was that you know, we're finding that children very often like to watch two screens at once. They might be sitting with the television uh, on, but with maybe a, a, a device on which they've got Facebook or something else at the same time. But it is drama, as opposed to other genres, that really absolutely captures their attention uh, in, in a, in more than other genres do. And ch children were asked, why do you enjoy local content? What reasons do you have for preferring to watch Australian uh, content in the case of Australia? And it's really about the familiarity of the places, the situations. It, they like the relevance of programming to them. I would actually like to, 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 to add to that that I think kids love to watch themselves and their peers on television. And they like stories to be realistic. We had a long discussion earlier about, you know, the way in which, if I could use Disney as an example, our kids get an awful lot of very American, American very Americanized view of, of, of kids today. But this is, this is the, the, the logic for local content, that it is more relevant to our children today. Next one, please. Worth just having a bit of a word about broadcasters. Um, and I think that, you know, we are frankly in a transition period. Uh, television remains the greatest aggregator of audience for, for all age groups. But we are seeing uh, new delivery methods, um, streaming to mobile devices, tablets and so on starting to become increasingly, um, increasingly, pop increasingly popular. But the, at the moment, uh, TV remains core to, to, to reaching a broad children's audience at, at this point. Um, I think that uh, this is something, this is a subject that I'm sure we will return to. But one of the reasons um, why I think television is so important is that it has a great ability to promote a program to its audience. Um, it's often, whilst it's certainly true that kids are watching more and more content on devices other than traditional television screens, the fact remains that they need to know, they need to have a means of finding out what's on, and the television schedule remains a very powerful part of that. Now this one that we've already gone to is an analysis of what is going on in the breaks on commercial television between children's, the breaks between parts of children's programs, the commercial breaks. And what that's telling you is that 61% of what's there is devoted to toy ads, and that only about, I think it's 8% is promoting other kids' programs. So, I mean, that's just a, a statement about that again reinforces where the interests of commercial television lies, that, you know, that, 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 that imperative. Could we go to the next one, please? So how do children find out about, about drama programs that they may wish to watch? What this rather complicated graph is showing you, I think, is that for the real young kids, up to seven, it's very much about what their parents are telling them. But as they get older, it becomes increasingly about what they hear from friends at school, the water, water cooler discussions they have, and, um, uh, and an increasing sophistication at finding uh, content. Could we go to the next one? And now to focus a little bit on what was discovered about producers in the course of this. Um, let's go to the next one, please. 
These two charts demonstrate on the left the number of dollars and on the right the number of hours of production of children's program in Australia over the past sort of decade. Um, and what you're seeing there is uh, what actually prompted this research, which is this slight decline uh, of drama production that is being seen in Australia. Um, and um, that is of some extent a worry, but if we go to the next uh, 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 slide, you can see here the, uh, an interesting breakdown in what is being produced in Australia. And this is focused mostly on animation and drama. Now, what these two charts is sh are showing us is the growth in the production of, well, of co-production of programming, which I think reflects the difficulty of financing shows, and the growth in animation, which comes from two things. One is kids love animation, but the other is that it's much more co-producible. And I think that that is uh, a key point in terms of what is practical for producers to, to, uh, to deliver uh, in, in today's environment. Um, and if we could go to the next chart, this, this is an interesting chart which shows the difference in financing sources between children's and adult programs. If you look at down the bottom, you will see that in Australia, 67% of the funding for adult drama comes from domestic broadcasters. For children, on the other hand, it's up to about a th half of that, up to about 34%, as you can see in the top. What that is telling us is that, and as the chart shows, is that children's, the production of children's television is much more international and co-production oriented than is the case with adult drama. And the fact of the matter is that uh, what that certainly led to in Australia is a bunch of producers who are actually quite adept at raising international finance through a variety of sources. Uh, and I think that that is going to continue. It, it doesn't make it easy for producers, but that's kind of the reality. So, you know, that's, uh, that's that one there. Um, and that's really, let's go to the next one, uh, that's really kind of the, the the end of that, of, of that research and, and, and what it showed. And the, as I said, the key findings are children prefer programs made directly, made specifically for them, that their choice as to what they watch differs with age and levels of parental control, that they do put an emphasis on drama, but I would like to add to that as a broadcaster the fact that we very often find that a good comedy show or a strong wildlife show can garner every bit as big an audience with kids as a drama. And of course, this is a real issue. In Australia now, children's drama costs often in excess of a million dollars an hour to make. There really isn't a great difference anymore between the cost of a child's drama and an adult drama because children are sophisticated. They, they expect high production values. And on the other hand, a good reality show that might only cost, let's say, of a wildlife or science space or something like that, that might cost less than $100,000 to make per half hour, as opposed to half a million, can very often be garnered just as much audience as can a drama show. So that's the conclusions that I can offer you from what's going on in Australia at the moment. I think it's worth, at this point, perhaps um, asking for any comments or questions that might clarify or deepen any of those bits of uh, information we've been given. We, we clearly hear that children want local stories. We, we've been given some evidence on how they're accessing and using them, using their various, um, various screens. Um, we, we are hearing the difficulties of the uh, industrial model. 
Uh, is there something that people would like to ask about further in terms of that research project before we move on to refocusing it back on to New Zealand? Yes. In, in terms of the animation co-production, that, that seems to be working maybe better than live action. Is, is that in any part down to the fact that there's a, a lot of cheap sources for that in Asia? <coughs> well, there are two issues that you're raising there. I think... Uh, first of all, um, my background is animation production, and when I went into being a broadcaster, I kind of assumed that animation was going to be predominantly uh, popular with preschool rather than school age. What we've discovered is that the love of animation actually goes right up to about 12, 13 years old. Um, we've also, and I think the reason why you're seeing a greater prominence of it on that chart is because animation is more co-producible. You can break up the elements much more easily and share them with international partners than is the case with live action drama. And as a result of that, um, not only is it a popular genre, but it's one that can be financed more easily. Does that answer it for you? Could we ask that people say who they are uh, and maybe... <coughs> what industry they're in, so that we can um, obviously know what perspective people are coming from. Yes? Robin Nathan. Um, I was interested, is there any flow through between New Zealand and Australia, or are we totally separate entities? Because you seem to have a lot more going for you than we do here. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. There's, there's quite a lot. I mean, I always get to know, Twitch. Twitch is on ABC3. We have New Zealand Animation on ABC3. We um, are working in development with, uh, with, with uh, Pukeko uh, on an international animation co-production. Um, there's a great willingness to work uh, with New Zealand. But uh, the previous question also asked about Asia. And I think that one of, this is another aspect that I'd like, just like to bring up. You know, what we're seeing is in countries like Malaysia, Korea, Singapore and others, we're seeing a great level of sophistication in animation production emerging. We're seeing a very strong financing ability coming from those territories. And those territories that used to be used for, as it were, service work, are now becoming partners. And the way I see children's production going is it's becoming increasingly international. And where those partnerships are coming from, they used to be traditionally Europe, you know, the UK, France, and so on and so forth. That's really dropped off now. Canada remains a strong co-production partner because it has very strong production incentives that can contribute to the financing. But if I, I'll take a small bet that if we were to hold this group in 10 years' time, Asia will be the predominant partner uh, because of the, the money that their governments are putting into productions, because of their skills, and because they are great partners. Where, what, Asian need, what Asians need, and that can come from New Zealand or Australia, is the ability to mould a programme to work internationally. And we do quite a lot with CCTV in China. And why does CCTV want to work with ABC? For one reason which is that they want to see their shows sell internationally. And they make huge amounts of animation that is purely for domestic consumption. But the Asian partnerships are going to become increasingly relevant. And I think that could work as well for New Zealand producers as it can for Australian producers. Can I just take one question? Yes, on? yes, you can. Um, you're, you, know, you say how sophisticated children are in terms of what we used to see with animation. Can you hear at the back? Yeah. Yep. Um, because it is quite expensive and not allowing for the Asian co-production, which we haven't done, I don't know much about it. Can we, can we do anything with going the other way in terms of, do you think children would watch things that are more hands-on style animation than really spiffy stuff that they've become used to? I'm sorry, I'm not quite, <coughs> you're saying, can, sorry, you, can you rephrase that? Yes, can I rephrase that? No, move on. <laughs> move on and I'll have a Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm happy to come back to it. I just wasn't quite clear 
Well, children are sophisticated in watch, what they watch. They're used to seeing things of a very high grade yes. in terms of what yes. places like Asia can produce. Because it's hard to get the money to produce that sort of thing, um, it's easy to do a lower budget version. What do you think the reception of that is? Oh, of a lower budget. Thing, or to something that might have innovative ideas, but the production might be 2D, right? You know, like Oh, I, I, I don't think I, I mean I don't think everything has to be CGI at all. I, I think cheap, cheaper animation methods like Flash are very, very successful, and and it's all about the storytelling. If you've got a, if you're telling a good story, if you've got a good script, if you if you've got characters that kids engage with, it really doesn't have to be expensive CGI at all. That's my view. That's my experience. Uh, I think there was a question up here and then down here. Um, yes, thank you. Kilda, my name is uh, Jacinda Ardern. I'm a member of Parliament from New Zealand. And my, my question was whether or not you could expand on your view of the relative importance of um, uh, central or, in your case, federal government's role in encouraging and ensuring quality production for children. For children's children. Oh, <laughs> it's central. It is key. The reality is that... Your broadcast environment here is, is commercial, let's face it. And let's be quite clear, <coughs> if your agenda is commercial, why would you play kids' programs? You know, you can't over-commercialize it, you can't put as much ads into it, you're not going to get the same ad value, or, or sorry, the same revenue for your advertising time in between children's programs as you will with, with adults. So, in Australia, the, 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 the things that have made the children's industry possible are regulation that has required commercial broadcasters to play uh, and to fund children's programming. It has been funding through Screen Australia, our equivalent of New Zealand on air. And it has been the strength of public broadcasting in the case of ABC being given money specifically for children. Now, I understand that you don't have that aspect of it here. But the, but the reality remains that if you leave it to the market, it's not going to happen. There needs to be something to help make it work. Make it, make it work. I think that you know, what this panel is about is how can that be? What can we do? Here, here. <coughs> um, hi, Tim Riley, lawyer. Um, I was just, you, just picking up on the financing point and the fact that the broadcasters put a much lesser amount into children than they do for adults in Australia. Where does, so where does most of the foreign financing come from? I'm assuming it's co-production partners. No, no, no. Uh, not, not entirely. Um, for example, uh, it's a good, very good question. Um, Germany is an extremely important co-financing territory for us. ZDF, ARD, ZDF Enterprises are very big partners to Australian producers. Um, and that it, they are particularly suitable because Germany doesn't have the same hang-up about local content that other, many other countries do. So if you go to France, for example, it's all about wanting to see French programs. From a German perspective, they want to see good programs. And they're happy to engage with international partners be they New Zealand, Australia, wherever, in order to secure them. So, yes, co-production finance, where you split the production, is increasingly important because of financial constraints. But you can also raise significant amounts of money, and, and we have done it. For example, we have a drama show called Dance Academy that's been very successful. Now, that is funded by the ABC, Screen Australia, ZDF as a broadcaster, ZTF Enterprises as a distributor, and, um, and the ACTF. So, and that's produced 100% in Australia. We didn't even have to put a German character into the show. So there are, there are, other, there are other forms of finance available. I think we have time for another question before we focus it back on New Zealand. Obviously, we'll continue to discuss these threads. There was one more question up there. Yes. You, yes, sir. Um, Arthur Baston. There were some st statistics there comparing commercial and, and public television for children. I'm interested in a very simple statistic, and I wonder if you have it, which is what is the percentage of children's content in terms of broadcast hours as against other content in Australia? Do you have any idea? 
by channel, but it differs very much by channel. So trying to get something that we can compare New Zealand's treatment of children's broadcasting with Australia that a simple person can understand. So is that a valid comparison that you have the X percentage of children programming as against everything else? It's well, let's focus, if we could, on commercial broadcasters, because I think that's the, the key comparison. Uh, the only pro children's programs are, are played in the morning and in the afternoon in particular slots and at weekend mornings in particular because of license requirements on those commercial broadcasters. And it would be typical in Australia for, that, for um, there to be uh, an hour or so of local content in the morning and in the afternoon. Does that answer your question, Arthur? And the dedicated we, we channels. We don't really have public broadcasting on television outside of Māori television. And well, that's we why I was trying to get a yeah. model that was as effective as Australia. How could we do that? And it would involve some regulation because that's what's been happening. And we were talking earlier, um, Tim, about the dedicated channels and how all channels, tend, all broadcast channels, are tending to move children's on to dedicated yeah. channels. The point being, children like a destination and parents like a destination. For preschoolers, parents like to be able to say, if I put my child in front of this channel or this bunch of content, I know it's going to be safe and appropriate. In the same way, school-age children like to feel they have a place to go that is theirs, that is dedicated to their interests and reflects their lives. Now, ideally, you put on a digital channel and you do it or two and you do it that way. But there are other ways to do it, which I think we'll come on to discuss later. Yes, well, having just uh, got rid of our TVNZ6 dedicated children's channel or elements of it, um, it's, a, it's probably timely to move it back to a focus on New Zealand. And I'd like to, um, I'd like to throw a question to our storytellers, um, Briar. Uh, what... What stories are our young people missing out on? What, what, that we know the environment, what are they missing out on? Well, I think um, having a nine-year-old daughter, I'm, I'm kind of constantly aware of what she's watching, so I'm aware of what she's not watching, which are basically images of herself, of herself on television. So I grew up as a kid, um, my hero was Nancy Drew, and that, when I went into the world of play, I was Nancy Drew, which is quite a good role model to have as a young girl. My daughter and her uh, friends, when they, their tools of dreaming are quite different. So when they play, um, they emulate the characters out of a show called Monster, Monster High. So these, I guess in real life, they're you know, seven foot women with big boobs are quite girlish, you know, like they're, they're kind of half zombie. And she goes into that world. And whenever she goes into that world of dreaming, she puts on an American accent and her voice becomes quite loud. And the things her and her nine-year-old mate talk about is their boyfriends. Oh, this is, you know, and they're, they're doing all this role play. So th they are missing out on the world, our, our world, our culture as New Zealanders, as Māori. So when they slip into that, that state, that's, that those are the games they're playing, which makes you wonder, um, well, it raises a lot of questions. I'm thankful that um, our household, um, we're strong in who we are as, as New Zealanders, as Māori, so she is able to, she does have, she finds her identity in other ways. So I don't have huge fears for her future in that way, but we talked earlier today about what happens when a child doesn't have those, that resilient family around them, you know. We did have quite a robust debate around resilience, and I think it's really important to perhaps bring um, Ian back in um, on this matter. Um, would you like to make some comments? Yes, again, I, I might sound extreme, and I don't wish to. I'm not an extreme sort of a person, I don't think. But I came into this uh, interest uh, quite a few years ago when it became apparent that New Zealand had a high rate of suicide among young people. And looking around at reasons for that and the pattern, that, the time pattern that, it, that occurred and so on and the children who were committing suicide the, the groups of children who had that uh, 
uh, in mind. Um, I think if you're looking if you're looking at the fundamental issue, it's about not having hope, um, and that is about having a, a narrative, a personal narrative, a personal story, which doesn't have a happy ending, if you like. That doesn't, and in particular, not being able to fit your life experience and the way you see the world into what's in your head by way of images and, and stories that you've picked up. Now, I don't want this to sound too mechanical. Obviously, children pick up uh, images and stories from all sorts of uh, sources and, and uh, create them themselves. Children are wonderful in their imaginations and ability to create stories and the ability to fit themselves into their internal narrative so that they are the hero and they always do the right thing and they can get out of any kind of trouble that they find themselves in, etc. But when we're talking about resilience, there are some children that are not particularly resilient who don't get those stories, that don't find themselves able to make themselves the hero of their life story in a way which is healthy <coughs> and, uh, and safe for them. So that's that's why I came into this interest, and I, I you know, there's been a great deal of um, uh, discussion that I've had with various people about this in various walks of life. I don't think the psychiatrists entirely agree with me, but then they see things from a particular perspective. But I believe that this is this is the case that uh, it's so important to furnish our children with uh, stories that they can use. And, in, and incorporate into their life stories that make them resilient, that make them able to uh, face life's difficulties, whoever they are. We can't have a single story. We can't have the sports hero story, which we're quite fond of in this country, as a single way of seeing yourself. We've got to have a range of those. We've got to have diversity of stories, and they've got to be credible to the children. If they're Los Angeles stories, or London stories, or... Dresden stories or whatever, they, uh, children sooner or later find that they're living uh, a life that really is not their life. It, uh, the, you know, speaking, uh, dreaming with American accents as we've just heard. Um, it doesn't fit, so they can't um, make it um, helpful to their own uh, lives and dealing with their own life difficulties. So, so you're talking about scripts for ways of being yeah, and yeah, ways yeah. of being older and ways of being adult and yep. you, you've talked about issues around <clears throat> giving children tools to dream with and aspire with uh, you, you gave us a terrible statistic Tim in our discussion before that 25% of children have mental health issues at some point in their childhood I don't know whether there's uh, anything you need to say on this, or you, perhaps well, Ian, I don't know. No, I'd be interested to hear what Tim had to say, well, when you, what you were saying before. Yeah. When we were setting up ABC3, the School Age Channel, I spent some time with the Mental Health Association in Australia. Interestingly, I was encouraged to do so by Therese Rain, who was then the wife of our Prime Minister and who was giving us the money for this. And the statistic is that in Australia, 24% of children will present with mental health issues by the time they're 16, 24%. And what the people who deal with these issues tell, told us is that the, the more resilient a child is, the more they are able to deal with the stresses and strains of life today. You know, body image, internet bullying, all of these things that are going on, and, and, and what they encouraged us to do was to be telling stories that showed kids overcoming these adversities so that they had, so that the audience could build their resilience in that way. They don't have to be complicated stories. I mean, no. The sort of hero stories, uh, in some ways, the sort of the popular superhero genre that we have today is not such a bad thing. It, it shows children that you can get out of trouble one way or another, except that they, they are foreign uh, heroes. They, they're not... They're not, they don't fit so well with our way of life. Um, Yvonne, you might want to come in here because you've, 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 you've created that wonderful young woman in um, Kaitangata Twitch. Do you want to talk to this Look, water cooler this tools here to dream with? This is Meredith, and she was devised by Margaret Mahi. She is possible for any kid in New Zealand, boy or girl, 
She basically can do a bit of kayaking. She lives in an environment which is being destroyed by a property developer, and she, her family are protesting, but she can join that protest and worry about um, a piece of land that she cares a lot about. That's a possible image. That's not that American thing where children are pop stars by night and, you know... I think on that point, should we just play a little clip right. from, yes. from Kai Tanya to Twitch just to remem remind ourselves? So that was made for Māori television. Um, and there is a hero, I think, that uh, if we could have gotten that on more channels, but there wasn't another channel that wanted to pick that up as a second broadcaster. That's my problem, I think. Where are the screens? Where are the screens, yes. We've come here for the big picture, and I would like to dream the big picture would be that we'd all of us now committed um, to find a way through this for the kids. You know, kids can't choose, they don't vote, so we have to do it for them. And I want positive discrimination for the kids. I want ring-fenced funds for kids that don't get depleted out into other genres. The kids want what adults want. They want every single genre that adults get. Why can't they have the news? 
Why can't they have news and current affairs? Why can't they have their own um, music programs, their own uh, th their dramas and um, their, I don't know. You could, I think the lovely thing that would have perhaps happened with that was there needed to be a game show that allowed the boys to come in on this. And we have to have um, the broadcasting type program and then go out into the digital where kids interact with it. So well, let's do, let's some do it for the kids. Let's do some more envisaging, yes. you know, about where we can go. Do you want to pick that up a bit further, I would, I, I think that you should actually open the floor. Fine. If everybody is happy with that, would you like to say anything more as the panel prior, prior to doing that? No. Well, here we go. Um, yes, if you could say your name and... Yeah. Hi. So the promotional issues of being the, the found space by children. Yeah, yeah. So your focus is on educational content, is that right? Well, our focus is on the overall festival is about entertainment content. Entertainment, but it's more we, entertainment. Are, we realise that there are so many great New Zealand short films that are made about children or for children, mm -hmm. and we are about trying to connect audiences with New Zealand mm -hmm. and international short films, and we want to do that for, for the last seven, eight years we've been doing it for adults, but we realise... Yep. So it's that dedicated screen or the screen, the destination screen where you don't have to, you know, well, promotion will occur, but the destination screen you want to find, is it? Yeah. Can I? Yes, please. Um, I'm Jeanette Powell and um, Chair of the New Zealand Children's Screen Trust. It seems to me in terms of where we need to look is in terms of breaking down silos like education and film and TV. We haven't talked about film yet, but um, it, so it's, it's breaking down silos and, and creating partnerships and but I think we need a um, we need a groundswell. We need people to be talking about it. Um, you know, I, I know there's a lot of roadblocks in terms of the broadcasting environment and it's disrupted with the whole technological um, changeover. So really, um, you know, can we be visionary? I mean, do people th want to make a change? Um, are there any thoughts? Tim? OK. Uh, one of the th if, I, if I could talk for a minute about the way kids are engaging with content outside of traditional TV screens. Um, our experience is twofold. Uh, as I said earlier, preschoolers... Um, very often parents find it convenient to provide content on mobile devices, maybe tablets, that allow them to entertain their children wherever they are in the house or in the, in the car or whatever it is, uh, safe content. And there is, we have been absolutely amazed at the take-up of tablet watching by preschool audience. It's just absolutely blown our minds. There is a program called Peppa Pig. I don't know if how many of you are aware of it. <laughs> it is one of our top programs on ABC for kids. In Australia, a country of 20-odd million people, two million episode views every month on mostly mobile devices. So there, there, this is becoming an opportunity. If you then look at the school-age kids, uh, the drama series I mentioned before, uh, Dance Academy, 
Series 2, which we launched a year ago, in the launch of that 26-part series, we found that a year ago, 25% of the viewing was on mobile devices. This year, we launched Series 3, and it's 33% of the viewing is on mobile devices. So there is undoubtedly a, this, these, these new uh, platforms or, 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 or screens are becoming much, much more used by kids, but the issue remains, how do they know what's on them? You know, the great power of television is that they can, they have a schedule, they can say, turn it on at three o'clock and you've got this. And then, of course, having done that, they'll often go and watch it online for a catch-up. But the trick, I think, is to embrace these new screens, but to find a way of making sure that your audience knows what is on them. And um, I think that, you know, if we can start looking forward to some of the, um, the initiatives that may well um, start to be possible in this new um, transmedia um, digital age, it, it could be quite useful. Yes? I was going to say, I'm David Shaw, and I'm in the computer industry, and I've talked a little bit to, to me from Yvonne, and, and the project we're trying to get going is to sort of set up a, a virtual classroom Primary school children. Schools at the and moment, it's just uh, their own IT expert, in house expertise, particularly in primary schools. They don't have anyone specialised to set up their internet mm -hmm. presence, and they might have a blog online, but it's really their school front of house, so it's not really mm -hmm. for the kids. But, but I think there's a, there's a real opportunity for an alternative. Can, can Does somebody I, want to build can I on this? Respond to that? Yep. I, I, um, that just brings to mind uh, what Maya Goetz was saying when she was here from Bavaria just a few months ago, I mean, visiting the country. She showed some very nice clips of what they're doing there, exactly along the lines of what you're talking about. So that they get children doing things like growing stuff in the garden and etc. And it's interesting. And she says that kids are interested in watching that. It's kids like themselves doing things that they understand. Uh, but, you know, finding drama in it, if you like. Uh, and they don't have to be long, and I, I don't expect they're all that expensive. And one of the things that Maya asked us was, you know, why aren't you doing this? It wouldn't just be interesting to New Zealand children, it would be interesting to children internationally to see how New Zealand children speak, what they do, what interests them, etc., etc. And we're not doing it. You know, it'd be very easy to get video cameras into schools yeah. and just get kids to tell mm -hmm. a joke and, and put that online and kids would love to sort of look at other kids, see themselves uh, yeah. telling a joke. And yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just, uh, I've, I've been thinking about TV because um, you know, e even though we do have all these different platforms, I think for me TV is, well in my household is still the, is still the platform that my child or children engages with, seems to engage with the most and is the easiest for them. Yvonne, do you want to say anything? Well, I would just like to say that the family part of TV mm. is terribly important. And um, Kaitanga to Twitch was, the Māori television tells me, um, were four-year-olds to 80-year-olds sitting in the room looking at that program and talking. That's good. There's also something about our yeah. family drama, you know, like My Kitchen Rules, for example, which is uh, very popular amongst young children. And I think it's to do with... This is the time of the day where they actually get to sit down with their mum and dad and their parents. And it's become very po popular. Like, my daughter sort of plays out, mm. you know, she's cooking this and that. So there's something so, about that time and being with family. That's so that resilience, easy. those yeah. issues of family resilience. Mm. And, yeah. As you'll know, that it's, it's a real challenge to um, bring, and it was brought up up here, bring those children's audiences into the cinema. And because we're competing against such you know, flashy animations, etc., and the window for viewing for the, those audiences, weekends and school holidays. So, um, I guess the best, the best bet in terms of delivering um, high quality children's yeah. stories for cinema is um, we can't compete with them on one level, but it's creating really strong story and bringing that in at a, at a, at a lower budget, I guess, and working like that. And I just want to say from the a New Zealand Film Commission, we're totally, um, we're not shutting that door. We're very um, 
supportive of children's cinema and we've actually got two family dramas, family not children's, in development at the moment. The other thing is I want to talk about was um, some of the um, applications we do get in in regards to cinema and it's something about that long form storytelling. Uh, we don't have a, his, such a deep, rich history of that in terms of children's drama in that long form. So it's quite challenging developing the talent in that area as well. So often the, application, the, the uh, stories we get feel episodic, more television orientated in, in their nature and scope. Play School has been running on ABC television for 47 years. It is a half hour show. We make every year about uh, 45 episodes, new episodes every year. And uh, it is a show, the format of which is very simple. We have a couple of presenters who are generally adults who are known to the parent audience who are singing and, 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 and play, making, creating uh, simple things out of household, uh, household possessions, sort of making, in other words, imaginative play is the focus of it. And there's a lot of music that goes with it. And it has just evolved a tremendously uh, faithful audience. Um, 47 years on, it is regularly in the top five or ten of our shows. And um, it's just evolved a real place in, in, parent, in Australian families. What would you say are the values of that show? The values of the, of the show are imaginative play. Um, they are... Um, React, they are about people reacting with what kids are interested in. It's about song and music. And the values, I would say, are really about um, taking kids on a journey using very simple props. The thing I love about it is that there is quite a large stable of presenters, but every one of them is a hero. We used to. Susie's yes, sitting next to you. Can I just thank you all for coming on behalf of Script Screen, the Big Screen Symposium and the Kids on Screen New Zealand Children's Trust. I mean, we're just wanting to start the conversation and, you know, I, I think um, we're very small as an entity, but if you can check in with us, it would be great to follow up from Martin saying, you know, I, I don't want the vision to kind of die here in this room, it's the start of a conversation, it's a seed. Um, and I don't think it's just the grey power, I think it's the mothers. And, um, you know, I've been my own little public broadcaster at home for a while now, kind of giving, feeding Susie's world to my children. Um, so, um, you know, so I want to continue that conversation. I think we need another forum and I hope that we will find a way to make that happen. And so that we, you know, come, there is an election coming up, um, you know, we can make it a real um, issue. Um, and that we're all talking about, and it goes beyond the industry. Could and you give the website so everybody can jot it down and join? Yes, um, it's, well, it's kidsonscreen.co.nz. Uh, and um, uh, we've also got a Facebook page. It's, it's just about, you know, we will hopefully, we've got a newsletter getting started. Uh, we want to get the information out, so if there is another forum, you can come join us or have your view and um, be welcome. So thank you, and thanks for coming. Can I just say a very big thank you to Jeanette, because she's got an enormous following in the Australia too.